If you're here this morning and that is just absolute hogwash to you, welcome. We're glad you're here. And I understand it. It seemed crazy to me. And then out of um, just grace and uh, God's kindness in my life, I began to ask questions and really go, look, if it's true that Christ is God and he died for me, that's all that should really matter. And so I started asking a lot of really hard questions to see if that was true. And some of those questions we're going to answer for you in the next 12 hours as we gather here and just invite you to really begin to look at the evidences of God's eternal power, his divine attributes. We want him to be clearly known. And so we're glad that you're here and you're trusting us with this morning. And we pray this evening, tonight, from 7 to 9, we are going to have a creation conversation. And we are going to look at the evidences in science, in empirical data that demand the existence of an intelligent designer of some sort. That whatever you want to say, if you don't want to ultimately um, agree that the Christian uh, God is the designer, that's your decision. But what I'm going to show you tonight with my friends is that it's going to take a greater amount of faith for you to believe there isn't some designer there than it does to consider that potentially the story of, of Romans 1 is true, that God has revealed himself in the beauty of his creation. This morning you're going to get a little taste of that. Uh, a man that I now call a friend, Steve Meyer, is going to be here. Steve is uh, from Washington State originally, lived in Dallas with us from 81 to 86 when he got out of college. He uh, got degrees in geology and physics, and after being here for five years, then uh, went to Cambridge University, where um, he got his PhD in the philosophy of science. And Steve is now uh, part of what's called the Discovery Institute, which seeks to discover truths, which will reveal to us ultimate truths that we want to know. And he's going to be with us this morning to encourage us, even as tonight, uh, some of the, uh, not some of the, I think the top three scholars in the world on this topic are with us this evening. And that would be not just my perception, it would be the other side's perception. That if we could get rid of these three bozos, things would quiet back down a little bit. But these three bozos uh, are, uh, are going to come and share with you information empirical data, science, facts, and then we'll see what you want to do with it. That's up to you. Good morning. I'm Steve Meyer, and I'm awfully glad to be here. Thanks to Todd for the invitation to share his pulpit. I'm not often in the position of giving a sermon. I'm actually a scientist and a philosopher. Uh, according to Wikipedia, though, I do have an honorary degree in theology. Uh, <laughs> The Wikipedia people aren't too friendly to the idea of intelligent design, so rather than report that any of us are scientists or philosophers, they, uh, I've been called an American theologian, so look it up, it's kind of fun. Uh, <clears throat> sorry about the tie, my wife heard I was coming to Dallas, she dresses me, and um, we're actually from the grunge part of the country, and so uh, I thought I was doing pretty well, but <laughs> next time I'll know. Anyway, thank, it's uh, awfully good to be here, and, to, and, to, and uh, I've heard a lot about Watermark, and it's exciting to hear your story. And I want to tell you a little bit about ours. Um, about three years ago, um, 2006, there was, uh, there was a, new, uh, a new publishing phenomenon. It was called the New Atheism. It came right on the heels of a lot of publicity about the theory of intelligent design, which we'll talk about tonight. But there were, in 2006, 2007, 2008, a spate of books that came out by leading academics, sometimes scientists, sometimes philosophers, who were claiming that the evidence of the natural world, the evidence of science, had either conclusively disproved God, or if not quite that, at least rendered belief in God tantamount to a delusion. The most famous of these books was the book by Richard Dawkins, the book called The God Delusion. And according to Dawkins, the strongest reason for believing in God was the classical argument from design, the evidence in nature pointing to God's handiwork. And Dawkins said, since the design argument has shown to be defunct, in particular by the theory of Darwinian evolution, we can now safely declare that belief in God is an illusion it's, or a delusion. Another book by Daniel Dennett, a professor at Tufts, called Breaking the Spell, same message. Uh, the spell that needs to be broken is religion. The thing that breaks the spell is science. 
And in the ensuing couple of years, books by Christopher Hitchens, uh, Sam Harris, and any number of others have been repeating this same message. Science has refuted the existence of God. Um, now, that's kind of an odd thing, I suppose, for m many folks here. Uh, if you're aware of the biblical perspective on this, it's, it, there's a clear challenge in this, in this uh, view of the new atheists. According to the Old Testament Bible, uh, the, the, the Hebrew Bible, the heavens declare the glory of God. I like to circle when I'm lecturing uh, to students the word the heavens. It's the evidence from the natural world that is telling us something about the reality of God, says King David in this psalm. Uh, the same message is repeated in the Christian scriptures, in the New Testament. St. Paul's epistle to the Romans affirms that, um, that the, the attributes of God can be known from what has been made. Here's the verse. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, qualities His div eternal power and divine nature, sometimes translated wisdom, have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made. Again, something about the natural world, the things that are in the physical world itself, according to the Scriptures, reveal something about the nature and existence of God the Creator. Uh, well, the, so the New Atheism obviously challenges that perspective, but interestingly, it also challenges the perspective of the very founders of modern science. The first scientists who got the scientific enterprise going in a period of time called the Scientific Revolution uh, from roughly 1300 to 1700. This is a front piece from a book by a man named John Ray, who is uh, arguably the founder of modern biology. This was written in 1667, 1666. And uh, notice the title. It's, uh, it's a, basically a paraphrase of that same verse from Romans that I just cited. He says, it, he, he says what he's studying is the wisdom of God manifested in the works of creation. You might, if you look closely, you'll see it's using that old English F for an S, so if you pronounce that exactly right, it would be manifef manifested in the works of creation. But in any case, this reveals the perspective of the early scientists, the scientists who got the scientific enterprise going. What were they doing? They were studying the handiwork of God, and they believed that in studying the, the, the things that were made, that those things revealed the reality of the attributes of God, and by extension, His existence. Now, th this perspective culminated in the great work of Sir Isaac Newton who made design arguments, arguments for the reality of, as he put it, an intelligent and powerful being. Uh, he made these arguments in his famous work, The Optics, in his work on the eye and how the eye processes light. He also made them in his most famous work, The Principia, the work in which he laid out the theory of universal gravitation. Here's a quote from that. He's talking about how the, he's talking about the planetary system. And he, knowing about the law of gravity and how the different planets exert forces on each other, he's, he is marveling at how there could even be a stable solar system in which all those gravitational forces would balance just right and keep the planets in their stable orbit. Turns out even today this is not a trivial thing at all. If you try to model this in a computer domain, it's very difficult to get out beyond two, three, four, five planets. Uh, all the interacting forces become very complex to model. And it's, uh, this, is, this was no trivial thing that Newton was reflecting on. But anyway, he says, uh, gravity alone cannot explain why everything is so delicately balanced. And Steady says, this most beautiful system of the sun, planets, and comets could only proceed from the counsel and dominion of an intelligent and powerful being. Now, a couple of years ago, I was in a hearing, the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights, um, and they were investigating whether or not there was viewpoint discrimination in the teaching of biological origins in the public schools. Uh, when I heard about it and was invited to participate, I thought, I, I wouldn't think you'd need a hearing to establish that. But in any case, I was there, and I was uh, being grilled by one of the commissioners about my, my uh, views on the theory of intelligent design. And the commissioner kept asking me about where I had studied and did my supervisors at Cambridge know my point of view and, and uh, uh, would, I, would I be comfortable explaining my views in a, in a, in a setting uh, at university today? And it, I, the, the tone of the questioning was rather hostile. And then suddenly, as if 
by surprise, he changed course and said, isn't that theory of intelligent design you hold exactly the same perspective as, those er uh, as the early scientists, people like Kepler and Boyle and Galileo and Newton? And, and when he said the names of my heroes, I brightened. And I realized maybe he's on my side. And I said, well, yes. And so I, I, I mentioned that Newton, in particular, had made arguments for intelligent design. And right as I said that, my opposite number, the person testifying on the other side, jumps in and says, says yes, but Newton, Newton was, it's true, he was a very religious man, but he took great pains to keep his ideas about intelligent design and God out of his science. And at that point, I muttered under my breath, Lord, thou hast delivered mine enemy. <laughs> uh, because I had just written an essay, it was in my, it was in my, my uh, briefcase, and I had this quote nearly memorized. And I, I found myself saying something that sounded very impressive. I said, <laughs> I, I said, well, actually that's not true. Just as a matter of the historical record, Sir Isaac Newton, uh, in the in, I said, in the general scolium to the Principia. The general scolium is the introduction, that's all it means. I said, in the, <laughs> sounds good, doesn't it? And uh, I said, uh, in the general scolium to the Principia, now this is the part that I really liked. Arguably, I said, the, the greatest work of science ever written, and it may well be. I said, I said, he wrote, and then I quoted this. And at that moment, a number of the commissioners who were, there were eight of them, it was a very impressive, kind of intimidating, so, several of them suddenly smiled, like, this is going to be a lot more interesting than we thought, you know. <laughs> so, any, anyway, the, the point is, the early, the scientific revolution was founded by scientists of great faith who had a theistic worldview, who believed that there was not only evidence of design in the world, but that that evidence revealed something about the nature of the Creator. So how do we get from Dawkins, or rather, from Newton to Dawkins? How do we get from King David to Dawkins? How do we get to this point where it's been assumed that there is no evidence of design? Well, there is a, 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 there's a story, as there always is, and it's a 19, it's a start in the 19th century, and it was really the story, the, the century of uh, the I have no need of that hypothesis, that God hypothesis. There was a book in uh, 1802 written by a French physicist named Laplace, and uh, he tried to do what Newton said couldn't be done. He tried to explain the origin of the solar system purely by reference to undirected, mindless forces and the laws of nature. And after he wrote the book, it was called The Celestial Mechanics, it was a big fat book, it was, uh, he was called in to see Napoleon, who had a copy of the book, and Napoleon is supposed to have asked him a question. And he said, look, I read your book, it's made French science very proud, you're to be commended, but I noticed that you don't mention God in your book anywhere, whereas when I read Sir Isaac Newton, God is on nearly every page. What gives? And Laplace is said to have replied, Sir, I have no need of that hypothesis. That's my French accent, sorry. Um, <laughs> and uh, the God hypothesis, no need of that hypothesis. One time I tried that, and there was afterwards a lovely Parisian woman came up to me and thanked me for the talk, and I thought, oh, I'll never try that again, but here I did it, I don't know. Um, <laughs> so anyway, uh, but the point is, 19th century science, this, this is the beginning of the 19th century. No need of that God hypothesis. We can explain the solar system without reference to God. But then, it's not just the solar system. Then in geology, people come along, uh, Charles Lyell, famous geologist, and he gives an account of the canyons and the mountains by slow, gradual, undirected processes. And then in biology, uh, we have the theory of Charles Darwin, who by reference to the undirected process of natural selection, attempts to give an account of the origin of all new forms of life from pre-existing forms. Other scientists come along and extend his ideas to try to explain the origin of the very first life itself in the same way. So by the end of the, the 19th century, you have this seamless or nearly seamless explanation of all the major events in the history of the cosmos, stretching back from the very beginning right up to the origin of humans themselves by reference to undirected processes. Now you might say, well, what about the very first, the matter, it stuff from, uh, the matter itself from which all this stuff came? But in, in the 19th century, physicists believed that the universe was eternal and self-existent, that it was, it was infinite in time and space. So even the old argument that, that uh, you need a first cause to get the universe going went by the wayside because it was assumed that the universe had always been here. It was the thing from which everything else came. 
There's a, uh, an old story that uh, Stephen Hawking tells, the famous Cambridge physicist in the wheelchair, you know, the, the, with the Lou Gehrig's disease. And he, he tells about a, uh, a young uh, student who's from a, a small country town, probably in Texas, as some, you know, this stereotype goes. He goes off to Harvard, and uh, he's learning about, how the, about the solar system. He's just amazed that, you know, the planets go around the sun, and they're just suspended in free space. So at Christmas break, he's back, and he's at a, a, a church function, and a little old lady comes up to him and says, uh, 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 well, how are you doing at, at, at college? He says, great, I'm learning all about the solar system and how the earth is suspended in free space by the laws of gravity. It's so awesome. And the little lady says, no, I don't think that's right. There's a, the earth is, is on the back of a turtle. And the student kind of smiles and says, well, yeah, but what, what's, the, what's, what's, what's underneath the turtle? And she says, well, I can see you're real smart, but it's going to do you no good. It's turtles all the way down. And <laughs> This is the, why did I do that? This is the view of the 19th century. It's not turtles all the way down, it's material causes all the way back. You ask, where did humans come from? Well, we came from lower animals. Where did th those come from? From still, still simpler animals. Where did they come from? Well, that first simple cell, that kind of primordial amoeba. Where did that thing come from? Well, from the chemicals in the prebiotic soup. Where did they come from? Well, the elementary particles going all the way back, and there was no beginning. That's the view that came out of the 19th century. Now, if that's true, that's not just a scientific proposition. That becomes something like a philosophy or a worldview. And you can think of that, we, we call that worldview materialism. The idea that matter and energy are the thing from which everything else comes. There is nothing else besides matter and energy in the beginning. In fact, there was no beginning. In the materialistic worldview, if you think of the, the prologue in the book of John, it says, in the beginning was the word. In the materialistic worldview, you have a contrast to that. It's the idea, not in the beginning, but from eternity past were the particles. And the particles became complex stuff. And the complex stuff evolved and eventually became alive. And that complex living stuff evolved further and produced us. And then that living stuff conceived of the idea of God. Is there God in the materialistic worldview? Oh, yes. Is God a reality? Well, no. God is, in the words of Richard Dawkins, a delusion. It's a concept in the mind of God, or in the mind of man. So the materialistic worldview is the exact flip side, the reverse, the inverse of, of a theistic worldview. In the theistic worldview, you have God existing. God is the thing from which everything else comes. And in his mind and in his intention, and from that intention, he brings the universe into existence. He speaks it into existence by his wisdom and intelligence. In the materialistic worldview, it's exactly the opposite. You start with matter, eventually you get to us, and then we conceive of the idea of God in our minds. And so Dawkins says in his book, The God Delusion, he says, creative intelligences being evolved necessarily arrive late in the universe and therefore cannot be responsible for designing it. God, in a sense defined, he says, is therefore a delusion, a pernicious delusion. That's the, then the, and that's his title. Okay? And that, this is classic materialistic philosophy. You start with matter, matter arranges itself and produces everything else, including this pernicious idea of God, which you are here this morning to celebrate. How, do, how does it feel to celebrate a pernicious idea? Um, okay, I used to draw these horrible um, uh, cartoons on the, on the blackboard and to, to convey these big ideas. And my students got so tired of my bad drawings that they finally said, can we convert you to PowerPoint? And uh, so th this is what we've got here. This is a picture of the naturalistic or materialistic worldview. The big circle there represents the physical world. And inside the circle is everything that exists. The pendulum thing that's knocking the guy over, that represents the laws of nature. Then everything else, the mountains, the canyons, the trees, the, the birds, that's also part of nature, part of the material world. But that's all that exists in the materialistic worldview. There's nothing beyond matter, no God, no purpose, no intention, no ultimate meaning, just matter in motion arranged in a particular way for a temporary period of time. That's the materialistic worldview. Now, um, this view is the view that allegedly science supports. And it came out of the scientific theories of the 19th century which is one of the things I find so comical about the claim that this is the new atheism. This is the old atheism, and in fact, it's an atheism that is not consistent or uh, really up-to-date with what science has found over the last 80 years. And that's what I want to talk about today. It's kind of a prelude for tonight. Um, 
uh, what I want to show is that there are a series of discoveries that have been made over the last 80 to 100 years, and particularly in biology within the last tw uh, 20 to 30 years, that are, I think, challenging this idea of materialism, this materialistic worldview. And instead, I think they point in the direction of a theistic worldview, such that I think it's fair to say that St. Paul had it right and Dawkins has it wrong. Let's look at a few of these. Uh, this is, the, 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 the story really starts, the reversal of this movement towards scientific materialism, I think really started in the 1920s. There was a man named Edwin Hubble who was uh, an astronomer, he was a lawyer who turned to astronomy, and he did it at just the right time. It was just as these large 200-inch telescopes were being built. This is the, the famous dome telescope at the Palomar Observatory at Mount Wilson in Southern California. And Hubble was one of the first scientists that had access to this wonderful technology. This is a front or a piece of or a picture here of, of Hubble at the telescope. And uh, he began to notice using this, tech, uh, this, this telescope something that no one else had ever noticed before. He started to take pictures of little tiny pinpricks of light that were in every direction of the sky. And with this telescope, he was able to resolve that light and to, and, and, and to bring it into focus. And he realized those little tiny pinpricks of light were actually, actually had structure. They were galaxies. Now at this time, nobody knew that there were galaxies beyond our own Milky Way. We, the Milky Way, as far as we knew, was the only one. Some scientists thought there might be some others, others doubted it, but Hubble, for the first time, established that there were galaxies beyond our own. And in fact, in every direction of the sky that he looked, he found galaxies, galaxies, galaxies galore. And that was a pretty amazing, mind-blowing discovery in and of itself, because it suggested that the universe was far vaster and grander than we ever had any inkling. A galaxy, of course, is a collection of stars, millions and millions of stars, and what Hubble discovered is that there were billions of, of galaxies in every direction. In fact, if you take a little tiny quadrant of the sky, such as the one that's in the box here, and then you zero in on that, bring that into focus, it reveals more galaxies. It's, the universe is immense, and this was Hubble's first and greatest, a great discovery. But then he discovered something else about the galaxies. The light coming from the galaxies was redder than it would otherwise be. It was shifted into the red end of this, the spectrum. And you know if you shine light through a prism, it, you, you'll have, it, it'll, it'll stretch red to violet, there'll be a range of light. Well, when, when something is moving away, the, the wavelengths of the light stretch out and become more red in appearance. It's called the Doppler shift. Has anyone, anyone heard of this or aware of this? Um, we're probably most familiar with it with sound. If a train whistle is, if a train recedes from us, the, the sound of the whistle goes down. We used to have this in Seattle, this uh, uh, beer commercial, and uh, it was, uh, it was, there was a company called Rainier Beer, and they put the, the, the Rainiers, they called them, they were, with, they were beer cans with antlers, and they were driving motorcycles. And as they, as they went off in the distance, you'd hear them saying, Rainier Beer, you know, so like that. That was the Doppler shift, okay. Um, okay, so I wore a tie, but I brought beer into church, so okay. Um, all right. So, um, that's what Hubble discovered. What, what was the point here, Meyer? Okay, that was the point. The, 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 the galaxies were receding away from us, like the beer cans, okay, or like the, the train whistle. And, and he could tell that by the shift in the color of the light. And it, this phenomenon was true of the galaxies in every direction. And so that indicated something amazing about our universe. And now you get the balloon with the galaxies drawn on them. If the universe is expanding outward, as if, the, if the galaxies are receding, that means the universe is expanding outward, like this. Okay, so if you go, as you're going forward in time, the universe, is, the heavens are literally being stretched out. Okay, now what happens though, if you think about, if you, what the scientists call back extrapolate, if you wind the time sequence backwards, like one of those Saturday morning cartoons where suddenly Bugs Bunny starts, you know, going like this, what, what happens to the universe? As you go back and back and back in time, you get to a place where all the matter is congealed into one point and you get a beginning to the expansion. Now, this was a kind of mind-blowing conclusion. Uh, a Belgian priest uh, named Lamatri had already predicted this on other grounds, that the universe ha should have a beginning, 
he was a physicist, a priest physicist. Now Hubble discovered this. And this got the attention of a guy from Princeton with bad hair named Albert Einstein. Um, you may remember uh, Einstein, of course, the famous physicist, theory of relativity, theory of general relativity. And his theory of general relativity had a lot of math in it. And the math described the various forces that were at work, both gravitational forces and forces that he thought were necessary to, to counteract gravity. And according to Einstein's equations from the, that flowed out of his theory, there should be, and the universe should be expanding and decelerating. That's general relativity implied. The math of the theory implied the universe should be expanding and decelerating. And Einstein, being a smart guy, realized what Hubble realized, that if the universe is expanding now, as you, in the forward direction of time, that it must have also had a beginning if you went back in the reverse direction. Now, Einstein did not like this conclusion very much. At the time, he was very much a, a, a materialist in his, in his thinking, philosophically. And so he kind of took his pencil out from behind his ear and started fudging his equations a bit. And he introduced into his equation a, an arbitrary term that eliminated the implication of a, of a beginning. That term was called the cosmological constant, for people who care. Um, but the, the point is, uh, we used to call this dry labbing in, 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 uh, in, in, in school. If you were doing a science experiment and you knew what the, the result was supposed to be, but you didn't quite get the result, well, then you kind of you know, not that I ever did this, okay, but you, you fudge the data a little bit. Well, what Einstein did is he fudged the math a little bit to get rid of the, the embarrassing implication of a beginning to the universe. But no sooner had he done this than Hubble made his famous discovery. And Hubble invited him out to, to um, the, the Palomar Observatory, and the media were assembled, this famous physicist or cosmologist and physicist meeting, and Einstein went in, some famous newsreel footage, 1931, he looks through the telescope, comes out and meets the, uh, to address the media, and he says, I now see the necessity of a beginning. <laughs> That's my German accent. Okay. <laughs> the necessity of a beginning. And he later announced that his cosmological constant, his little fudge factor, was the greatest mistake of his scientific career. Now, Einstein wasn't the only guy that had a hard time with this idea of a beginning to the universe. One of the leading British astronomers at the time, Sir Arthur Eddington, said this. He said that philosophically, the notion of a beginning of the present order is repugnant to me. I should like to find a genuine loophole. I simply do not believe the present order of things started off from nothing with a bang. The expanding universe is preposterous. It leaves me cold, he said. Okay. So what's the problem here? Well, he's got another theory. In psychology, they call this theory denial. Uh, <clears throat> did you notice? He doesn't cite any evidence. He's not got another, it's not really a theory. It's, it's a reaction, okay? And what's the reaction predicated on? His philosophy. Note that first word. Philosophically, he says, the notion of a beginning is, is repugnant. Why? Well, he also, probably without even thinking about it, has adopted this default worldview of, mo of many modern scientists, or contemporary scientists, and that is, that, that, that is the, the worldview of materialism. By the way, that is the dominant worldview in our culture today. Uh, one of the ways we found this is when people, when the media started covering intelligent design, we found they were all against it. And they, did the media know any science? No, but they had this worldview that said it couldn't be right. And so if you, if, if, if you send your, your, your kids off to university, if you encounter the media, or the law schools, or the courts, this way of thinking, that there is nothing beyond nature, no higher moral standard, no ultimate purpose, this is the, the worldview that dominates our culture. And that's why we have what is sometimes called you know, this cultural conflict, because there's two different ways of thinking, the more traditional Judeo-Christian theistic way and the, and the materialistic way, and it, it pops up in all kinds of issues, from the sanctity of life to the question of moral responsibility, to whether or not we're responsible for our actions, whether criminals should be uh, absolved because uh, you know, their genes and their environment made them do it, or whether they're really morally responsible. These are manifestations of this worldview conflict. Um, okay, in any case, what's the big deal? Why are the scientists so upset about the idea that there might be a beginning? Well, one physicist put it this way. He said, an infinitely old universe would relieve us of the necessity of understanding the origin of matter at any finite time in the past. On the other hand, if the universe is finite, had a beginning point, 
then it's not eternal and self-existent like materialist philosophy says, and that suggests the need for a cause beyond the universe, a cause that transcends the natural world, a cause that is perhaps supernatural, and that's very upsetting. Uh, the other part of the big deal is that, um, I'm going to skip this part. <laughs> Another part of the big deal is that this perhaps inadvertently confirms one of the key scriptural teachings about the universe itself, namely the first words in the very part, first book of the Bible, in the beginning. There was a beginning. And oddly, after centuries of physicists thinking the universe had no beginning, um, the, this scriptural teaching has been confirmed by new, new discoveries in physics and cosmology. Um, by the way, this, this idea of a beginning recurs repeatedly in the Scripture. Also in, uh, in, in Titus and in Timothy in the New Testament, uh, while referring, Paul referring to the plan of God, he talks about a, 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 the plan of God existing from before the beginning of time. And one of the interesting things about this new cosmological idea is that it's not just that the universe is expanding, it's that space and time come into existence with the, with the expansion, that space and time are connected to matter, so it all begins, there's what the physicists call a singularity. So all these things have, I think, uh, put mater the materialistic worldview back on its, on its heels, but, there's, there, but wait, there's more. Um, in the area of physics, we've learned something else. We've learned that in addition to there being a, a beginning which suggested a, a cause beyond the universe for the universe itself, We've learned that the laws and what are called the constants of physics, the, 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 the strength of the different forces and the rate of the expansion of the universe and the speed of light, all these things are very precisely calibrated to allow for the possibility of life. Scientists call them the anthropic coincidences, anthros for man. The idea is that there are all these finely tuned parameters that make life possible. And one physicist has illustrated this with something he called a universe creating machine. He asks you to imagine that you're on uh, maybe something like Star Trek, the next generation, and you're out there in space, and you come across a space station, and you go inside, and inside there's a, a, a room that says universe creating machine. And you go inside the room, and there's a console, and on the console there are all these dials and knobs, and each one is set to a very particular value. And because you're a physicist and you're good at math, you begin to work on this, and you realize, wow, you know, if I change the, the gravitational force constant, if I make gravity a little tiny bit stronger, a little tiny bit weaker, life would not be possible. If I made the expansion rate of the universe a little tiny bit faster, a little tiny bit more, or a little tiny bit less, life would not be possible. In fact, the expansion rate of the universe is fine-tuned to one part in a trillion, 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 trillion. One part in 10 to the 60th is like a penny, in a, a penny out of the federal deficit, only even more finely tuned. In other words, <laughs> you, a little bit this way, a little bit that way, but that much, and life isn't going to be possible. So this physicist, John Polkinghorne from uh, Cambridge University, says, well, uh, what do you make of this? What do you make of this fine tuning? And uh, one possible explanation, in fact, one that Polkinghorne favors and many other physicists is that the universe was finely tuned because someone finely tuned it. What a concept. Here's a scientist, Sir Fred Hoyle. He was actually one of the, uh, he was early in, early in his career an atheist who was opposed to the evidence of a beginning for the universe, but he later in life acquired decidedly theistic leanings. And this is what he said about the fine tuning. He says, a common sense interpretation of the data suggests that a super intellect has monkeyed with physics as well as chemistry and biology. I always like the way the monkeys make it into these origins um, <laughs> theories, even about physics. So you have this evidence, I would say evidence of design in physics right from the very beginning of the universe. The universe has a beginning, but the universe as a whole has a structure in its basic fabric, in, in its laws, and, in its, and in, in its other parameters that suggest design right from the very beginning. Now, in addition to that, and this is what we're going to talk about tonight, there is also evidence, I think now overwhelming evidence, of design in biology, in life. Um, the classical Darwinian perspective is that there is no design. Design is an illusion. Things look designed, but they're not really designed because there's an undirected mechanism, namely natural selection, that can mimic the powers of a designing intelligence. Richard Dawkins puts it this way. He says that biology is the study of complicated things that give the appearance for, of having been designed for a purpose. 
Can you uh, pick out the key word in that quote? Appearance. Appear I hear a lot of people saying appearance. Exactly right. It looks designed, but it's not really designed because uh, we have this mechanism that can modify organisms and cause them to adapt to their environment, and it's all completely uh, undirected. Well, that was the Darwinian view, but a lot of scientists are beginning to challenge that, and they're beginning to challenge that because of things that are being discovered in biology, in the miniature, especially in the miniature realm of the cell. During Darwin's time, we didn't know what, we, what the cell was like. We thought it was, a, in the words of one of his contemporaries, a simple homogenous globule of undifferentiated protoplasm. It was a simple blob of jelly, of goo. But now we know that inside cells, it, well, the inner realm of the cell is a realm of exquisite nanotechnology, miniature machinery. Behind me on the screen is something called an ATP synthase. It's a little energy generating turbine. It runs on the same principle as a hydroelectric dam. There is a rotor inside a stator that cranks a shaft and creates torque, which is then stored as energy and uh, is used to create a little battery pack, a chemical battery pack that runs, that gives the energy for everything inside the cell. Now, uh, where'd this come from? This thing looks designed but has anyone explained it away on the basis of an undirected process? Actually, no. There are no good explanations of, of complex systems like this. And Michael Behe, who's going to talk tonight, will, will talk about why that's the case. Um, here's another, another look at the same thing. You can see all the intricate moving parts. This is, by the way, in the mitochondria of your cells. You have these little, these little turbines operating right now. They're keeping you alive. Everyone, you know, it gives new meaning to the phrase fearfully and wonderfully made, okay? Um, here's, here's something called the nuclear pore complex. I really like this. It's a gated porthole, and um, it, it opens and closes to allow the strands of, of information to flow in and out of the nucleus of the cell. It runs on the same principle. Let's see, it's got all of these space age parts. The same principle as uh, the, a card key at the ho hotel. If you've got the right code on the key, you stick it into the, uh, the slot. A little, there's a, there is an information recognition system there. If, you, if, you, if it notices the right code, the door pops open. If not, it stays closed. Same kind of thing going on in, in, inside the cell. Complex, very sophisticated information recognition scanners that determine whether or not certain strands of information with certain instructions are going to make it in or, or, or not. Very sophisticated technology everywhere you look inside the cell. Also, th this is a, uh, something that you may have seen already. Michael Behe, who will be with us tonight, has made this famous. It's a little rotary engine in, uh, in the cell wall of a bacterium. It's called the bacterial flagellar motor. It's got a rotor, a stator, bushings, U-joint, O-rings, and a whip-like tail that functions just like a propeller. It spins, the propeller spins at about 100,000 RPM and can change direction on a quarter of a turn. Now, Behe argues for some reasons that he'll explain tonight that this is not the kind of system that can be built by natural selection acting on random variations and mutations. And he's created an international debate about this little motor. It's, it's amazing. This is by no means the only machine, the only piece of high-tech nanotechnology inside the cell, but it's become uh, the focal point of a, of a big debate about whether or not there's evidence of intelligent design in life. And Behe will not only share his, his initial argument about this with you, but he'll, he'll respond to some of the attempts that people have made to try to explain technology like this away by reference to slow, gradual, undirected processes. So he'll bring you up to date on where the, the current standing of the debate is tonight. But if you uh, you're just looking at this, you might find yourself becoming a little skeptical about the idea of um, purely undirected processes being able to, to build all this intricate technology that we have inside cells. Here's a picture of Mike. He's a very good communicator, by the way. I think you'll enjoy him tonight. Um, then there, one other area that I'm going to talk about in closing here, and this is what I'll talk about tonight, but it's this thing that gets me really excited. It's, it's the, the whole question of information and where that comes from. It turns out that, that inside cells, there is information. If you want to build that bacterial flagellar motor, keep your eye on that, that kind of tubular part there, that, that's the U-joint at the top. Uh, if, if you want to build that inside the cell, or the way the cell builds it, is it builds it out of smaller constituent parts called amino acids. And the, every, all proteins, uh, all these 
these pieces, these motors are built of proteins, the proteins are built of amino acids. But to build each of these parts, the amino acids have to be arranged in a very particular way so they exert forces on each other and fold up into these right structures. And the big question in biology is where does all those, how did the amino acids get, 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 get arranged? And the answer is they get arranged because of information that's stored on a molecule called DNA. DNA has digital code that functions like a machine code or a machine instructions, assembly instructions, to build all these intricate parts. And so at the base of life is not just matter and energy, but instead information. I used to ask my students, if you want to give your computer a new function, what do you have to give it? And they would say, well, a program. Well, the same thing is true in life. If you want to build new parts for a machine, or if you want to build a new, provide the cell a new function, or if you want to build a new form of life from a pre-existing form, or if you want to get life going in the first place from simple chemicals, you have to have information that are to, to direct the organization of all these material parts. Where does that information come from? Well, it turns out nobody really knows, at least not from an evolutionary point of view. Attempts to explain the origin of the first life have stalled repeatedly at this same point, the, the, at the point of explaining the origin of the first information. And there's, I think, a good reason for that. Um, Bill Gates here says that DNA is like a computer program, but far, far more advanced than any we've ever created. What do we know about computer programs? Where do they come from? Wind and erosion and other natural forces? No, they come from programmers. They come from intelligent minds. And in fact, everything we know about the origin of information suggests that it always comes from an intelligent source. So when we find information, digital code, stored in the DNA molecule, the, it, it's, it, the, the most logical thing to infer is that DNA and the information it stores also had an intelligent source. And so we'll talk about that more tonight. Interestingly, just to bring this full circle, Richard Dawkins has acknowledged that the machine code of the genes is uncannily computer-like. If you saw him in the movie Expelled, you also noticed that he acknowledged that, you know, that this might be some kind of signature of intelligence, and that, but of course Dawkins wanted to attribute that, if there is such a thing, to an alien intelligence in space. We call that the ABG option, anything but God. Um, uh, in any case, I'm going to argue tonight that, as one information scientist said, the creation of new information is habitually associated with conscious activity. That what we're looking at when we see digital code in life is an artifact, a hallmark of intelligence. So we'll, we'll talk more about that tonight. But I think that's a, a, a very exciting discovery, which, when combined with the other things we've looked at this morning, helped to explain why historians of science might be saying things like this. That the idea that God created the universe is more, a more respectable hypothesis than, uh, today than at any time in the last 100 years. We have evidence from cosmology of a definite beginning of the universe that seems to be pointing to some kind of transcendent cause beyond nature, beyond the universe itself. We have evidence of fine-tuning that suggests that that cause may have been intelligent and that the, that the universe itself as a whole was designed. And then we see that down the line, in, after the beginning of the universe, we have evidence of design in the origin of, these, of this nanotechnology and this information technology that's in every cell of every, every living organism. All that added together, it looks to me like something that's pointing to something more than just matter in motion, to, to mind and maybe even a mind that transcends exceeds, is beyond the universe itself. And uh, so th that's a very exciting prospect, and one that I think suggests that, uh, that St. Paul uh, was right, that there is something about the things that are made that point decidedly to the attributes of, uh, uh, of God, his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine wisdom. Uh, one other person who's going to speak tonight is David Berlinski. Uh, David is, uh, I, I would describe him as an agnostic Jew with theistic leanings. And he has written a very important book called The Devil's Delusion. And it's a critique of Richard Dawkins. And he takes up the defense of, um, of theists, Orthodox Jews, and Christians who believe there's good reason to believe in God from science and who also are offended by this new atheism. And uh, David has a, a wicked wit and he, I think, dismantles the, the arguments of the new atheism, showing them to be really sophomoric and I think he's really good value. I think you'll enjoy him tonight, and he'll add a lot to our program. Uh, he, couldn't, he couldn't sign your statement of faith, 
but um, I think he will do a lot to affirm the worldview that many of us hold in, in his really excellent scholarship and his, and, and, and his penetrating critique of these new atheists who've been doing so much to try to undermine the, 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 the credibility of, of belief in God in our time. So I'll leave it there for now, and, uh, and thank you for your great attention. Yeah. Wow. Great. <clears throat> I don't, I, don't ever, I don't ever want to hear you guys say that I gave you too much information ever again. <laughs> that was great. See, I sat out there and I liked it, so quit complaining, all right? That was great. Good, good stuff. I'll tell you just an interesting fact about David's book, uh, who's coming tonight, The Devil's Delusion. He's saying that this, this idea that there is no credible empirical data for God's invisible attributes, his divine nature, his eternal power, he said, it is a lie. And, and he is not even of our camp, if you will. Wikipedia doesn't call him a theologian. But he's saying there is a spiritual worldview behind it because nothing else could make people drink this nonsense. His book, actually, if you go buy it on Amazon today, it's going to cost you about 60 bucks, The Devil's Delusion. You know why? Because it sold out quickly and the publisher refused to reprint it because it did not want that idea out there. Now, when people are willing to sacrifice money to suppress truth, what's that tell you? That there's something behind this. Because New York publishers don't usually turn away money. Gang, I want to tell you, this battle is not just about truth that will get your science correct. It is a worldview which is affecting how we view human life, how we view morality, how we view government. See my last fall. And it's why we're going to dive back into this together. This is the question. And if you get science wrong, you know, it's just going to be an embarrassment. But if the science that you get wrong because you've suppressed truth, keeps you from ultimate truth that is life, it's a much bigger deal. Listen to the song, and then I'll close this in a second. Well, gang, this is why we are diving into this, because we think there is truth there, and what's at stake is not just maybe uh, suppressed evidence in the science classroom. What is there is suppression of the only truth that really matters. I have a nine-year-old son. We were riding the car yesterday. He said, Dad, is there a chance that what we believe isn't true? And I said, you bet there is. And don't you ever stop asking questions. And one of the ways that you can know that what you believe is true is that they're not scared of questions. When you tell me something, you should never have to change your story if what you tell me is true. And I said, you ask questions. Don't ever feel like you're disrespecting Dad or what our family stands for by asking questions. Because God has told us to love him with all of our heart, all of our soul, but Cade, he's told us to love him with all of our mind. He doesn't ask you to leave your mind at the door. He says, bring it to me. God says, come, let us reason together. And folks, what I want to tell you is there, what Steve said in his general scholarium to tonight, that, that just means introduction, Steve. <laughs> What he was telling us in our intro to tonight was there's never been a time in human history more than the last hundred years when God is screaming to you, it is true, don't miss me. And folks, if you think it'd be a privilege to have lunch with Newton and Kepler and Boyle and to learn the the, the thinking behind these men who have understood that there is design in our universe, what if I told you the designer that they long to understood is reaching out to you, and he invites you to understand his mind, and it is in the book called the Bible. And as scientists scale up their intellectual heights, they are creeping up over the precipice, only to find the theologian looking him in the eye, and we've been there for centuries. And God has called you to know him. Read the book. If you have questions about this God, come. We're not afraid of him because it's true. And the further you go into nanoscience and the further you go out into the universe, you see his fingerprints there. And he has revealed himself to you in his Bible and in his son, Jesus Christ. Don't scoff. If you scoff, 
you alone must bear it. If you are wise, you are wise for yourself. And we invite you to come. We invite you to bring your friends. We invite you to know Jesus Christ. We know the name of that intelligent designer. And he has revealed himself with an empty tomb. If you know him, will you go and enjoy him and declare him? And if you don't, will you come and let us ask those questions with you? We'll see you tonight.